The title of this lecture is Your Mind and Body Are a Trap The Necessity of Out of Body Soul Projection. I always say this where do I begin? <laughs> I'm, I apologize. Um, there's so much I have to say. And yet I'm at a loss for words. The the lower bodies, this particular the mind, begins to outcreate soul. And I remember, um, I think most people here listening probably have seen the movie The Matrix, <clears throat> which was a long time ago, but it's sort of a, a cult classic. And I've seen it many times. And in that movie, I don't have to, probably not have to really describe the plot much. But in that movie, um, there's this artificial world that's created um, that entraps the minds and, and bodies of, of, of these people who are actually in pods, like life support pods, who are, in a sense, you could say dreaming. Uh, in this artificial computer-generated reality in the future. Of course, this is all science fiction. But it captured the imaginations of a lot of people. The, the movie, I'm talking about the movie The Matrix. Well, the mind begins to outcreate soul. And so you might ask, well, what is soul? <laughs> you know, what's... The difference between mind and, and soul. It's an interesting question. Um, soul is that part of us. It's, it's our true self. That's eternal. Unchanging. It's our God self. You could say that, that as soul, we are gods among other gods. That we're each these individual sparks or, or drops from this ocean of love and mercy, which is the um, actually a place that can be visited. Now, the mind and body, and also I'm also speaking of the astral plane here, the astral body, these various lower bodies can turn into traps. Now, they don't have to be traps. And this is what's interesting about all of this is in Vardenkar, we learn to die daily. And we learn to go into these higher states of consciousness and eventually reach what's known as total awareness. We get, <clears throat> excuse me, we get beyond the worlds of time and space, matter, energy, time and space, or mast. And in doing so, through out-of-body projection or soul travel or whatever you want to term it, it's the act of leaving the body as soul and moving into these various planes and states of consciousness. Now, the problem, there's many problems with this. Um, one of the biggest problems is that Soul tends to, even if it manages to move out, which is actually quite common in the dream state and other, other times, um, even if it manages to move out, it tends to move out into these lower planes, these lower states, such as the astral plane. So we have astral projection, which is really limited, obviously limited to the astral plane. Now, the astral plane is very, very large. And there are many sub-regions within it. It's not one state of consciousness, but many, many, almost countless states. But within these countless states, as we move higher in the astral plane, the vibrations, the vibratory rate becomes finer. And so we see a little bit less matter and a little bit less matter and more spirit. So the, the difference between the lower astral plane and the High astral plane would be quite dramatic to the person who's having the experience. And a lot of people have these astral experiences 
in, in let's say the mid astral plane or the or the, as we move up the higher astral plane and they're convinced that they've had these god experiences um they have it's basically they have no reference point and so they falsely believe that they've reached this high this high state um and there are many many different states of consciousness and we have a god worlds chart you probably already seen it if you're listen if you've listened much to our talks but we have a god worlds chart on the vardenkar site it's probably if it's on video now probably on the video hopefully but it's uh, vardenkar.com v a r d a n k a r.com and this chart is just a representation it's a very primitive um sort of a roadmap very simplistic roadmap of what's out there so that we don't get trapped now the negative power who basically runs the these lower worlds this is a school the earth world the lower the lower planes the astral plane the causal plane the mental plane the etheric plane they're all school grounds for soul to um to develop and and learn however soul most people don't realize that soul spends millions upon millions of reincarnation of incarnations on these various planes many, many times the physical and so it becomes a trap now every all these realities all these different planes you know moving up through through the lower planes into the higher worlds there's a dividing line between the etheric which is this the super mind or the subconscious mind um, and then we reach through the void, which is a very dark region, almost like a fence, that keeps souls from accidentally wandering into what's known as the first of the pure positive God worlds, where there's no matter, energy, space, or time. We we enter the world of Satnam, who's the Lord Ruler there, and this is known as the Soul Plane or the Atma Lok. And the word here is is uh, you can chant Hugh Ray each individual letter H U R A Y or you can chant Satnam's name but this is the first um this is the area of self realization where soul has dropped its lower bodies and is now in this pure state now soul itself has a 360 degree viewpoint soul is a, always a happy entity and soul knows through direct perception it doesn't require a mind it doesn't require an astral body it doesn't require anything it's self-contained because it's a particle of god it contains all of the the qualities of the hue or god but but it's more than qualities. It's it's the beingness. I am I am therefore I am the amness, the beingness. And so, the Hure or God loves soul regardless of of any actions that soul may take in the lower worlds. Anything that um, we might as in the human state judge ourselves as being unworthy. Now. In the lower, um, in the lower bodies, we begin to take on this negativity. We begin to, once we get below the soul plane, the current splits up into the um, into the field of opposites. The, you have the positive and negative polarities. You have um, darkness and lightness. You have love and hate. You have mountains and valleys. You have greed and generosity. I mean, on and on and on. We could. Um, human history is filled with opposites, opposite polarities, and of course we have middle ground, and then we have the the neutral or the middle path, which is the middle path is neither black magic nor white magic. Now, existing through all of these planes, is the Varden, which is the light and sound of the Hure, 
and it's found at different vibratory rates. And we can tune in to what's known as the, the returning wave. There are two waves that come out of the Godhead, also known as the ocean of love and mercy. The first wave, I, I, if you can say the first wave, I guess it would be, would be the wave of creation. It's the descending wave that issues out from the Godhead and it creates all of these other planes as it flows in vibration. It descends in vibration. It lowers in vibration. And as it lowers in vibration, the Hure in its infinite wisdom, love and power, manifested these various rulers who are basically transformers for the power at this lower vibration. Now, when I say lower vibration, some of these planes have an extreme, extremely high vibration. Um, so you have to remember it's all relative to this, to the 12th plane, the ocean of love and mercy. Now there are planes above the 12th plane and I'm not going to go into that. Probably um, there's probably, there's no, probably no point in even going into that today. So there is no end. There's always a plus factor. There's, there's no point where soul reaches where, it is had has the ultimate state of consciousness. There's always a plus factor. But moving down is this wave of um, which is sometimes known as the Holy Spirit. We in Varden Car we call it the Varden. It's the light and the sound of God or the audible life stream. Contained within it is it's basically the voice of God, the voice of the Hure. Contained within it is all all attributes, love, wisdom, power, freedom. But it's it's even more than this. And of course it has this divine intelligence, which goes without saying. So this is the, the voice of, of God, the voice of the Hure. So this Varden, as Paul Twitchell, Paul G used to say, is um I'm not quoting him exactly, but it's the it's the Varden is the golden thread that's so fine as to be invisible and yet so strong as to be unbreakable that binds all beings together in all worlds and beyond worlds. I'm not getting that quite right, but that's the gist of it. And so it's interesting that it's so fine as to be invisible. It can be very subtle, but we can chant certain words and we can listen there often we may hear certain sounds on the god world's chart it shows some of the sounds that that emanate off of these different planes that we can hear these inner sounds we we may hear the chirping of crickets we might hear uh the sound of thunder roar of the sea the tinkle tinkle of bells the sound of running water the buzzing of bees these are all uh, some of the sounds that are found in the lower worlds but then as we move higher, for example, on the soul plane, we may hear the single note of a flute, but it's not an ordinary flute. You see, this is this is at a high, much higher vibration. And soul becomes enchanted with the, these this this sound current, the audible life sound current, the audible life stream. And it and the returning wave and the descending wave are, are it's a very interesting phenomena the returning wave is the most important you see the returning wave is the wave that soul rides back through these various planes now all these planes exist simultaneously so what we're really dealing with here is consciousness unfoldment and attention so the wave moves out from the heart of god the ocean of love and mercy on the 12th plane it moves out and it begins to descend in vibration and it creates these very these other various planes like the Hugh Ray world, which is the eleventh. The tenth plane is the Anami Lok or Lok. And the word on the Anami Lok is Hugh. It can be chanted H U a H U or 
part can be chanted. Hugh. Hugh. And each of these words tunes one into the, these various planes. Now we move down into the Agam Lok, which is the ninth plane. This is the plane of power where soul learns um, to balance out this love with power. Soul has to take its rightful place as a conscious co-worker with the Hure or God. And so the soul has to come to terms with this great power. Now this is one of the greatest lessons and difficulties that many souls face is man managing this great power and a lot of people are afraid it can be scary because we've all misused power in the lower worlds and we've been in the military and we've been people you know assassins and various past lives where we've misused power many 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 past lives most souls who've been around the block so to speak it's not all been you know flowers and and um and hum humming bees and, and beautiful uh lifetimes it's there's been many many difficult times and soul incurs various karmic debts which are not a punishment they're simply um the consequences for you know it's sort of like what you give out comes back to you at some point in some way but this is for soul's education and benefit now in Vardenkar we want to transcend karma and reincarnation because they're really a trap and the and the body is a trap. We don't want to be um, stuck in our skulls and finding the way through thinking, analyzing, you know, through basically through the mind or finding our way through the emotions, you know, of, of generating um, love energy and, and working with the heart chakra and all this stuff in the end it, it's fine but it's a dead end until soul learns to leave its body consciously and begins to travel with the spiritual travelers into these various planes and and meets with the the uh, god rulers and meets with the goes into these golden wisdom temples and studies the shariat kihire the holy different volumes of the Shariat Kihure exist on these different planes in these golden wisdom temples. Now these golden wisdom temples can be visited during the dream state and, and during the waking state through the spiritual exercises. And this is, this is very, um, this is a very important point that there are these golden wisdom temples. And this is where we study with the various Varden masters so that we can move on to the next plane and and become residents of, of the of the of the next plane and we move through these various wisdom temples and as we do we begin to gain the true initiations of Vardenkar. now a lot of people rebel against this idea well everybody's equal everybody's the same you know why should one person be above another well, all this one has to do is, is look at life and see that everybody is not the same. We have countless states of consciousness and states of unfoldment. And this system has been set up for a reason. And so we can't think our way in, into these higher planes, nor can we read our way in through reading books or thinking or feeling uh, or or through actions, you know, right actions, being kind, being good, that may generate good karma, which means more lifetimes, uh, but more pleasant lifetimes perhaps. But in the end, it's all part of this calistic system of education. So the Varden masters stand heads and shoulders above the mystery school teachers, the angels, the, the spiritual workers, not that, the, that they're not important, but that they have a different purpose. Their purpose is basically to prepare 
souls for the day when, when they're finally at that point where they're ready to make the journey. Until then, it's a matter of working out karma and balancing, and, and it's quite elaborate, the system that's been put here on Earth and the others, these other lower worlds by the cow, the negative power, and the various workers, spiritual workers in the hierarchy. Um, but the Varden Masters have a completely different, different purpose behind them. Um, their existence they're not here to to although they will manage their chilas their students karma um and work it out very quickly help work it out very quickly relatively um their true purpose is not to teach the mysteries of the lower worlds although the chila or student will learn many of these things as they move through the initiations but the true purpose is to bring soul back t into the to the Godhead, or at minimum, bring them to Satnam so they may receive self true self realization. And at this point, they re when they reach Satnam, a soul becomes spiritually liberated. They become free of this wheel of eighty four. Now they may choose to reincarnate again, but it's a choice now. It's no longer forced upon them by the lords of karma because of their past actions and because of their, their lack of progress. See, we we only reach the state that we've earned in this lifetime. So if an individual has only gone to the astral plane, they really can't expect much more than that because that's the level of consciousness that they're at. And the same thing holds for the causal plane and the mental plane. And so, if we don't find God in this lifetime, what guarantee do we have that we're going to find God in the afterlife or in the next lifetime, or the one after that, or the one after that? So the opportunity comes when one meets the Master. If, if they have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, and they're actually ready they will recognize the opportunity to, to return back to the Hure or God in a single lifetime. Or if, if they're older and they don't have the, the, time, the years on earth necessary, in, in the very next. As long as they're loyal to the spiritual exercises and to the instructions of the Master, the living Varden Master, um, who's basically the way shower, as long as they're loyal to those instructions um, as best they can and they don't give up, they're now on the most direct path back to God, which happens to also be the most difficult. It's the fastest path. It's the most direct path, but it's also the most difficult. Now, the idea of getting to God, and I, allude, I talked about this a little bit before, the idea of reaching God through through dancing or singing or creating art or music, or the idea of reaching God through reading, philosophy, studying, thinking, pondering, feeling, um, doing good works, all of these things have been tried. And the problem is that the vibrations of the Hure or God are so high that, to be honest with you, none of this touches God. God's not interested in how many children you feed, how many orphans you, you take in. Now, these things are noble things, they're selfless acts, and they generate, generally, if they're done with a pure heart, they generate good karma, which is, which is, um, which basically means that the person's lifetimes will be perhaps easier, they may progress to the astral plane and so on, it may speed things up somewhat, but it's still the path of pain, it's still the path of reincarnation. Because there's always another thing to do. As long as we are not, we have not reached these higher states, then we are at that level of unfoldment where we're not ready for that. Then we can't expect to see the face of God if we're dinking around in the astral plane or the physical plane or the causal plane or the mental plane. So at that point, we're in that vibration, that lower vibration, where that's what life 
is to us, that's our reality, is that particular vibration, whether it's the astral, the high astral, the physical, that becomes our world. Now, soul exists far beyond all of this. And I alluded to at the beginning that soul can be outcreated by the mind. And this is precisely um, what happens, is that the mind outcreates soul. So soul, in a sense, you could say, is waiting for an opportunity to, to get a word in edgewise. I'm, I'm being a little facetious here, silly. But soul is waiting, in a sense, to, to get a word in edgewise because the mind is so busy chattering and, and creating and outcreating. Now, we don't try to stop the mind because mind makes an excellent servant or good servant, but it makes a very poor, poor master. And so the reason we have all of these lower bodies, although they can be a real pain in the neck, is because we need them to interact in these lower worlds. So they're not bad. They're negatively charged. They're from the negative power. We, we're basically borrowing them. It's like renting something. It's like when you go bowling and you rent shoes and you rent a ball because you're not that interested in bowling, but you want to try it. It's like you're renting the shoes and you're renting the ball and then you go out there and you try to bowl. And uh, I'm a terrible bowler. I haven't bowled in, since I was a little kid. But the point is, my apologies to the good bowlers out there, but, um, but you rent the equipment and then when you're done... Uh, you return it and go home. And so, you know, we be, oh, most of us become so attached to our lower bodies, we don't realize they're, they're just rentals. You know, I'm, I'm half joking and, and, and really, but in a way I'm kind of serious, that they're just rentals. And people that talk about returning to their home planets, that they're starseeds and all this stuff, yes, yes, they've had past lives on other planets more than likely. And they've experienced um, what it's like to have a superior um, DNA. And uh, maybe they were on a Golden Age planet because they're different ages. We're in the Iron Age now, but you have the Golden Age and the Silver Age and the Copper Age and, and the Kali Yuga, which is the Iron Age. And each one becomes rougher and tougher. And in the Golden Age, there's no wars and disease is almost non-existent. And everybody's much more... Um, loving and spiritual in a way and then get lower it degenerates the cow comes in the negative part of the cow comes in more and more so a lot of people have these fond memories of of um being on other planets um or or past lives where things were perhaps more calm and naturey and they associate themselves with these various um, attachments to these past lives and these circumstances, and they want to return to them. Now, this is sadly mistaken for love, but in reality, it's really karma that they're dealing with here. When someone is is attracted to to be having a life with someone else, perhaps they they've had many many lives together. There may be some love involved in it, but a surprising amount of it is really just karma. It's it's cause and effect and the working out of, of, of karma. In other words, these two souls have karma, they have unsettled issues, and they want to come together again, like almost like magnets could be attracted to one another. They want to come together again and and work this whole thing out, as they say. And it gets very amusing at times because you'll have two men that go to war against each other, maybe from uh, fract you know, warring tribes or warring countries, and they'll go to war against each other, and one will kill the other, and um, and then the one that's killed is very angry and upset, you know, that he his life was cut short. He had maybe had a wife and two kids and. And this person kills him with a sword or whatever it is. And he's mad. And um, so now <laughs> there's all this energy there. Maybe the person, the soldier that killed the man that's angry at him is, um, I'm just making up a scenario here. He, maybe he really enjoyed it. You know, he thought it was pretty good feeling to get him. 
And so now you got this karmic bond between these two souls. And don't be surprised if the next lifetime, um, their husband and wife. <laughs> you see, that's how strange this can be. And so now they're fighting and, and the husband can't figure out why his wife is so angry at him all the time. <laughs> he doesn't understand it, you know. Um, and maybe it's because... Uh, because he had killed her when he when she was a man in a past life and now and now they're together working it out and learning um various lessons and this is a long long hard road to take and uh, you can see how this could go on and on and on it's, you know millions of lifetimes and so this is not the path of varding her what we have to learn is detachment and we literally, and we have to learn to 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 leave the body, to die daily, and go into these other states. And a lot of people are, are terrified of that. They're afraid of that. They think they're not going to come back, which is not true. The spiritual travelers um, will make sure they're they're fine, and um, a part of them, a part of their consciousness stays, and the body continues breathing and. and the body does not die, literally, but it it goes into this state where the individual soul is now able to travel with generally with the aid of the spiritual traveler, at least at first, and um, move into these different states. Now, a lot of people don't believe any of this is true. It doesn't exist. And it's kind of like, reminds me a little bit of the story of, of Kitty Hawk and the Wright brothers. Um, the only people that believe the Wright brothers were the ones that that uh, actually were on the airfield when they flew the plane. And so what would happen, it's kind of amusing, what would happen is they would invite all these reporters and, and people and uh, to witness the flight, you know, and they would do a demonstration. And all the people at the demonstration, they were obviously convinced. And they would take photographs and, and the press would report and... You know, when you see the National Enquirer, one of those ta tabloids, and you see, you know, Elvis is uh, coming, you know, and there's a picture of a UFO, and nobody believes it. So so these small little papers were reporting this, and and frankly, the, the public just didn't buy it. You know, they thought it was a joke, a story, you know, joke story. And this went on for quite a while, and the Wright brothers were frustrated. Because no, the only people that seemed to take them seriously were the ones that actually saw it happen. And that wasn't too many people. So finally, the, the government had to step in and make an announcement because people just wouldn't believe it, that there was a flying machine, you know, that was that was heavier than air. And so the government had to make an announcement that, yes, indeed, it's true, you know, and then p people began to, to believe um, that the Wright brothers had actually done it and that the history of aviation took off, no, no pun intended. Um... And from there, you know, now we have all kinds of interesting aircraft. Um, but it started out with disbelief. And so sometimes I feel that way. You know, I talk about these different planes and we have the the, the God World's chart on the uh, website and we show it on the video. And, and I could picture all these people saying, yeah, right. You know, like, uh, uh -huh. you know, like uh, Aliyah Lok, you know, Hukakot Lok, Agam Lok, Anami Lok, you know. Yeah, right. You know, you made up these these places that don't exist, <laughs> and uh, you know. But I I can assure you that these these um, if you can call them places, these planes are are more real than the the physical. They're a living, breathing reality for soul, and you can experience them. I've written a little bit about. I've attempted to write a little bit about what it's like to visit them, but to be honest with you, it, it pales. It pales by comparison to the actual experience, obviously. If it could be expressed clearly in words, then it, it wouldn't be real, would it? I mean, then it would be a product of the mind or a product of the emotions, which it's not. So you can only bring back a, a very tiny part of the experience and put it into words if you're lucky. 
And so I break my pen. Um, well, I, I, I use a keyboard, but I, metaphorically, I break my pen trying to, to put this into words. And frankly, it's not really possible. You can hint at it. You can try to describe it. And um, I think we have uh, some YouTube videos like Dialogues with Yabal Sakabi is a book that, that describes some of these places, these planes. I don't, I, I hesitate to call them places because it places denotes time and space at coordinates. But these are actually planes that soul can dwell in and, and experience and visit. And you can actually, uh, it's possible, and all souls will eventually do this to see the face of God or the Hure in the ocean of love and mercy. And all souls eventually reach this point. It's a matter of when. And so you have Vardenkar, which is the most direct path back to God, which is obviously going to be the path of bilocation or the path of soul projection or soul travel. It, there's no other way of doing it because the vibrations of these planes are so high that they cannot reach down into the lower world. Soul has to go up. You can't, you can't, um, you can't raise the building. You have to get in the elevator and you raise yourself. You know, it'd be like waiting for the, the 10th floor of an office building to descend down to the first floor. Um, you got to get in the elevator and go up to the 10th floor. The 10th floor isn't going to come down to you. Um, that's a ridiculous thought. And so you have a lot of people that are doing meditation and they're waiting for for this, these higher states to descend in, into them, into their bodies, into the, their consciousness. And they don't realize it. In Vardenkar, we use spiritual exercises. We don't meditate. Meditation is passive. You're waiting for something. And so we we follow the middle path, and we practice these spiritual exercises of Vardenkar. And we do true contemplation upon the works, the written works, the, the some of the lectures, um, various publications. But all of that is basically a doorway so that one can leave the body. So the mind can be a trap if it's run, if the if soul is being controlled by mind and, and the lower forces, the cow power, the negative power. Now the negative power uses um, the five passions of the mind, lust, anger, greed, attachment, and vanity. And it's basically, it's, its job is to distract soul and convince soul that it's already made it and that there's nothing further to do. In other words, you don't need to find these spiritual travels. You don't need to, to, um, to learn to leave the body because you're already there. You've already arrived or you're already leaving your body, you know, and going to the astral plane and that's all you need. Now, the New Age movement is kind of a disaster in some ways um, because it lacks understanding and focus. And so you have people throwing out all this different terminology like dimensions and, you know, dim I went to the 10th dimension or the 5th dimension. or And and so we have this huge problem in Vardenkar with, with terminology that people get words confused. Uh, many people don't understand what soul means and they associate soul with their lower astral body, the, their astral body. Because the astral body can appear like millions of of stars it's, it can it can glow and when you go to the astral plane there's much less matter and more spirit and as you reach higher into the astral plane as you go higher there's um things get better and nicer and more beautiful i always give the analogy of hawaii you know even on earth we have different states of consciousness we have different vibrations you know, going to a beautiful waterfall in Maui or, or Hawaii and then going into some desert, war-torn desert um, with, with machine gun fire, it, it's, a, it's a big contrast in, in, in experience and vibration. And that's just the earth 
Earth plane, the Earth, the, the Earth, one planet. You know, just move over um, two thousand miles, and and um, or not even that sometimes, and all of a sudden you're in a completely different, different environment, different state of consciousness, different experience. And so when soul has these millions upon millions of lifetimes, most people don't understand. They might have it what they think is good in in one in this lifetime, and then the next lifetime things can be very rough. And this is just the 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 whole law of balance. You know, things have to be in balance. This is in the lower worlds we have these dichotomies of good and evil, and so we're const we're constantly moving from one extreme to the other, and then in the middle and back. And this is just the nature of life in the lower worlds, is this duality. And soul has many, many, many different experiences, ranging from, from the most difficult, heart-wrenching experiences to, to, the, to tremendous elation. But each of these experiences takes place at, at these different planes, these different vibrations. And they leave a signature, and so we can learn to travel through the spiritual traveler who who is the way shower through the ancient teachings of Vardenkar, we can learn to travel into these various planes and have these experiences with these golden wisdom temples and with these different masters and with these different planes. And we can find out for ourselves whether this is true or not. And that's all that the master really wants is for the chila or student to, to have the, their own experiences and not take his word for it. Because frankly, that's the problem with religion. Religion tells you something is true, have faith, and um, believe it. No matter what it is that we're telling you, just believe it. And so a lot of people don't understand that Vardenkar is a path of experience. Now, not all people will have as rapid a growth and experiences as fast experiences as they want and this gets back to patience nobody in their right mind would expect to be a master pianist after a year of lessons it takes many many years and this weeds out a lot of the people that aren't frankly aren't aren't serious most people are just not serious they don't desire their desire for god is fleeting if at all a, a fleeting desire for God or a, a short, you can have a, you really have to have a burning desire that lasts, a lasting burning desire for God. And if you don't have that, what will happen generally is that the cow will come in and test you and the varden will test you and um, you'll fail the test because of insufficient desire because it's, it's a pain, it's difficult. Uh, it's not an easy path, and so the negative power will test, and, and most fail, frankly, most fail the test, because not only do they not have the eyes to see nor the ears to hear, but they don't have the desire, this great desire and this great humility to seek God and to be open. They seek the things of this world, they th seek the emotions, the physical, the physical things, and the mental things, and all of these lower things, and they confuse that for spirituality. And you see this every day, and it's fine. I, I mean, I have no problem if, if we each have our own choice. There's a path for all souls, and not all souls are ready. And so there's, I respect that each individual has their own path, which they have to choose and follow and be responsible for it. And so Vardenkar is never for the masses. It's always for those who have been chosen by the Hure or God to return to it. And it takes a soul who has a great desire and frankly, who's tired of, of, um, of incarnating and is tired of, of, of these lower experiences. Now we continue to, to hold on to these bodies until we finally drop them permanently. And so the bodies, as the as we elevate our consciousness and learn to bilocate, which means two, two places at the same time, if you can call if you can call the higher worlds a place, put our attention on on the we basically we can have our head 
I don't know how to put this correctly. Our soul, our soul, or our head in heaven, and our and our body on earth, and we are able to function and talk with people while being simultaneously aware of these of these different states of consciousness that we're able to project into. Because, frankly, they they exist simultaneously. So, the the masters practice what's called direct projection. Because at first, you know, we learn these techniques, these methods. But eventually you realize that we can just project. We can just go there. Since we're already there, we're just putting our attention in on, on these these different planes, these different vibrations, these different places. And, and again, I, I hesitate to use the word places, but these are states of beingness that we can experience that are not abstract. But they can be very, very subtle because of the high vibration, the high vibratory rate that they exist at. And so, you know, we use I use words upon words upon words, and it feels sometimes like I'm just going in a giant circle. And that's just the nature of thought, and that's the nature of words. And so I ask that if you do have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, that you read between the lines of what I'm saying. Because there's a certain vibration here that goes beyond the choice of words that I'm making, which are not always, you know, generally are not perfect, frankly. I wish I was a better speaker. I wish I was more eloquent. But frankly, even if I was, it probably wouldn't make that much of a difference. Those that are spiritually blind and deaf are not going to see it no matter who's talking, no matter who's the master at the time. And there have been many, many different living Varden masters. And Vardenkar has had many, many different names. It was briefly known as Ekankar under Paul Twitchell, under Paul G. From 1965 until 1971. It's had many names before that. I've mentioned the spiritual notebook that Paul G. wrote, that Paul Twitchell wrote, goes into that. It's existed in various disguises. Because frankly, there have been many countries, many places in time where you'd be killed for talking like like I'm talking now. You'd be executed, murdered, or imprisoned, or both. So Vardenkar is public for, for now. And um, I guess I'm kind of running out of things to say, um, except that Soul is lost without the master because this is just this midrid, me, I don't know how to pronounce that word, midrid, midrid, I don't know. This, these many, many different states of consciousness are so overwhelming, and there's so many traps and rocks and shoals for the student, the serious student or chila, that frankly. It's virtually impossible to do it on your own. And I know people that would resent that statement. But they're usually people that have a big ego who don't who don't understand. Nobody would attempt, no serious person would attempt to learn a, a complex skill without a teacher. If you really wanted to be good at playing tennis or golf or you wanted to be great at playing the piano truly great at it you're going to end up with a te- with a musical teacher or a, or a tennis teacher and you're going to pick somebody that, that that's at a level that's higher than you and some people have trouble admitting that there's anyone higher than them which i find very amusing i find it extremely amusing i mean nobody in their right mind would go to a world-class golfer like tiger woods and and say i'm just as good as you <laughs> um, they would quickly find out in a tournament that, that they weren't even as good as the as the worst of... Well, now, maybe there are some people that are golf pros, so I'm, I'm not talking about you guys. But for the average golfer, you know, he would, wouldn't do very well against somebody like Tiger Woods. So if he wanted to be like Tiger Woods, he would he would obviously need to study with somebody who at least was somewhere 
within that range, which might be difficult to find, but he would have to move up the ranks and he'd probably have to dump several teachers as as his proficiency increased and this would take years. So in the in the real world, you know, whether it's learning um software or anything that's truly complicated, most people recognize that it's a lot easier and faster to learn to to have a teacher that can that's already reached a, a level of competence that you want to reach. But it seems like when it comes to spirituality, the whole all the common sense just goes out the window. I guess this is the the great story of religion that never what's the old saying? Never um, argue about religion and politics at the dinner table, or never discuss it. I don't know if I believe that's true. I think there's a way of respectfully having a conversation, but people have gotten into some pretty heated fights, and uh, it can it can be a real it can be a, it can cause havoc if you have a Thanksgiving meal with your family and you haven't seen them in a while and you end up with a in a big political debate or religious so I can see why people came up with that idea of not discussing it so it can be very illogical people can be very um flighty and um, most people don't frankly put a great deal of of thought in, into this and they just go you know from day to day grind trying to make a living trying to to survive or or trying to pursue some kind of uh, sensory dream or physical dream they want a bow or they want a new car or or whatever it is they want a bigger apartment or or better love making or whatever it is better a relationship or whatever and though all those things are fine it's not that they're bad it's this that that priorities there are very few that are true God seekers that are the true seekers. You know, a small percentage of the population is actually true, what I call truth seekers and God seekers who are willing to sacrifice everything in order to see the face of God. And those individuals are rare. And frankly, most people don't have the eyes to see or the ears to hear. And it falls flat on them. And it's like, the famous poem i i can't i actually the poem goes something it's it's about um i think it's written by rumi uh but it's about a garden a secret garden and how there's a a wall around this garden which is very unkempt you know it's got weeds on it and it's dirty and it's just disabled and and um Everyone that walks around and this stumbles upon this wall, which inside the wall is this beautiful, beautiful garden, they curse the, they curse it because they look at it. What a horrible looking! They see the wall and the Savile wall, and they um, they never enter the garden. And he, in the poem, he says that th- this is on purpose to keep those out that aren't supposed to be there. And yet the garden is this most exquisite, beautiful garden, you know, with flowers. And it's just a, absolutely immaculate once you get past the the facade of the wall. So the wall is purposely unkempt. And sometimes I feel that way about Vardenkar. Um, I'm for, you know, I don't know. I have mixed feelings on it. But I give these talks and I try to present things and... Um, Frankly, most people don't have the eyes to see or the ears to hear, and they look at it and they see the door or the wall. They see the door. I like I like the analogy of the doorway better. But um, they see the door and it's all beat up and the paint's chipping off of it and the hinges are rusted. And they're like, what a horrible door. But those who are the truth seekers who are looking to see the face of God, they open the door. And that's really, so this is really an invitation for those that are sincere. And I hope I don't come across as being vain or egotistical. I'm sure some people will think I am. But frankly, this is an invitation for certain people. I'll say special people, but I'm getting a little, to be a little bit of a, as my wife says, smart ass. Um, Pardon the French. So anyway, I'm going to end this talk, um... By chanting 
the word hue again. I don't usually do this in talks, but H U H U H U Barakabashad, may the blessings be.